This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> Hello everyone and welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast in which we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Josh Milburn and I'm standing in for Siobhan O'Sullivan. Siobhan and I both like knowing animals. This episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA. ASA, that's A-A-S-A, is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. You can join for 60 Australian dollars if you're a waged academic and only 15 Australian dollars if you're unwaged. And unwaged here includes students and those who are precariously waged. ASA does lots of great things to support the animal studies community around the world. For example, they publish Animal Studies Journal, which is one of the few academic journals dedicated to animal studies. The next issue of Animal Studies Journal, which is Volume 9, Issue 2, is due to be released around the same time as this podcast. So do keep your eyes open for that. Articles in the journal usually come from a wide range of disciplinary perspectives, and so I'm sure that listeners from lots of backgrounds will find something of interest. It's also worth mentioning that the journal is open access, which means that you can download and read the articles even if you do not have access to a university library. This episode is also brought to you by the Animal Publics book series. The Animal Publics book series is a series from Sydney University Press focused on animal studies. In the last episode, I spoke a little about Meatsplaining, edited by Jason Hannan, which is the most recent book in the series. However, there are also two more books on the website that will be released at the start of next year, and they're available for pre-order now. The first of these is Dingo Bold, The Life and Death of Kagari Dingoes by Rowena Lennox. The other is Enter the Animal, Cross-Species Perspectives on Grief and Spirituality by Taya Brooks Preback. I encourage listeners to take a look at the Animal Public's website to find out more about these titles. This week on Knowing Animals, we're joined by Sue Donaldson. Sue is a research associate in the Department of Philosophy at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. She's also the co-founder of the Animals in Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics Research Group, or APPLE, at Queen's. Now, I've no doubt that she'll be well known to many listeners as the co-author of Zoopolis, a 2011 book about animals in politics that is now available in English, Chinese, German, Japanese, Turkish, Polish, Spanish and French. Today, we're going to be talking about a piece of Sue's more recent work that builds upon themes and questions addressed in Zoopolis. And this is the paper Animal Agora, Animal Citizens and the Democratic Challenge. The paper is, as they say, hot off the press. At the time of recording, it's forthcoming in the journal Social Theory and Practice, but it's available online in the journal's online first format. Welcome to the podcast, Sue. Thank you, Josh. I really appreciate the invite. So can you start by telling me what inspired you to write this paper? Right. Well, as you said, um, this paper builds on my ongoing work with uh, Will Kimlicka that we began in Zoopolis. And one of the claims that we made in that book is that domesticated animals are members of a shared society and political community with with us, with humans. Uh, And that means they're entitled to substantive citizenship rights. Um, Primarily, what that means is that they have a a right to a say uh, in the decisions that shape the society that we share. Um, But we didn't give a lot of details in Zoopolis about how that might work. And so we've been developing the picture ever since. And in this Animal Agora paper, I try to advance this this, uh, discussion in in two basic ways. Um, So the first is to emphasize the importance of empowering animals as political agents uh, and not just patients. The the status of being a political patient or a ward uh, where others speak on your behalf has a very problematic history, um, whether it's men representing women or colonizers uh, speaking for the colonized or property owners for the propertyless. Um, Robert Dahl, the renowned political theorist, uh, uses the word overwhelming um, to describe the Uh, the evidence that those who are denied opportunities to participate in governing will be adequately, um, will be inadequately represented. Um, And that's because 
even if someone is well-intentioned and wants to represent my interests, she simply can't understand all dimensions of my good the way that I can, and she isn't motivated to advance my good the way um, I am. So we have a very good reason to enable all citizens to directly participate in the political process in ways that work for them uh, so that they can influence the agenda of politics and, and the manner in which issues are deliberated uh, and the decisions that are ultimately taken. Um, so this idea, of course, goes to, to the heart of democratic theory and, and the, idea, uh, the idea of universal suffrage. But unfortunately, the traditional mechanisms that we have developed for political participation, say voting or petitioning or developing party platforms, um, these are all premised on certain capacities for participation by human language and rational discourse. And while this works okay for some members of the political community, and particularly well for those who are highly educated, have command of dominant modes of communication and persuasion, it doesn't work at all well for others. And most especially, we can think of young children or persons with cognitive disabilities who aren't fully autonomous rational agents, so-called, um, and, and are shut out of politics altogether. And, and nor can it work for animals. So we need to create different mechanisms for political participation um, that, that work for all citizens, not just a subset. So that's, that's the first part of Animal Agora, is sort of making the case for political participation for, um, for animals, domesticated animals. Um, in the second half of the paper, I explore what an alternate set of mechanisms for political participation political participation might might look like i call this the an alternative geography of citizenship uh, it's one that enfolds an actual embodied space not just in the abstract realm of language and the space of reasons um, so my view is that animals can propose ways of living by doing not by describing um, and this requires certain background preconditions in the general environment and it requires certain institutions to translate this action into the political process so that first requirement the background condition uh, is that domesticated animals have a secure and rich environment within which to develop and explore their good and interact with others to explore the common good and then the institutional condition requires that specific humans be charged with the responsibility to earn animals' trust, to observe and monitor what they do, to actively establish situations for them to respond to or to manipulate, and then to consider the political implications of these actions. Um, in other words, the human co-agent, as it were, asks, um, you know, are animals in their purpose of action providing information about their needs and desires or, or ideas about the public good that ought to be taken into account in political decision making? Uh, and the co-agent's role is to assess when public directed claims are being made and then to carry these claims into formal political institutions. Um, so this all sounds very abstract, I know, but in the in the paper, I, I tried to provide examples of how this might actually unfold in a in an imaginary community called Riverside, uh, and how soliciting and respecting and responding to the political participation of animals uh, could lead not just to better representation um, of their pre-political good, uh, but but to joint discovery. Uh, humans and domesticated animals together um, of public goods that contribute uh, to the flourishing of a whole community. So that's the basic, yeah, that's the basic goal of the paper is to advance those two agendas. Yeah, good. So perhaps we could focus first of all on the kind of, dare I say, the negative agenda of the paper. And that's the, the way that you think that the wardship or trustee model of animal representation is inadequate. Uh, so could you explain what it is that this trustee model offers and why you think uh, it doesn't work out? And I think it's worth noting as well that this is a model that's proposed not just by, you know, critics of animal ethics and critical critics of animal rights, but actually by other animal rights scholars. Yeah, that's right. It's it's actually, I'd say, the dominant position amongst uh, animal rights scholars working in, in political theory. Um, and let me say, first of all, that, that the proposals advanced in terms of, say, trustee representation uh, for animals would make a huge difference uh, to animals. So, so they would, um, uh, I, you know, despite the differences in views in this area, we all share uh, a basic understanding that animals are 
tyrannized under certain uh, con current conditions, that their interests and rights must be brought into politics and, and protected uh, and represented in politics. Um, so we have a broad shared agenda. Um, but I really do think that the difference uh, is a crucial one, this difference between the idea that animals can be represented as patients or uh, that they can self-represent as agents. So the, the idea that they can be represented by human, um, human trustees uh, assumes that we can know in advance um, uh, certain things about animals' well-being. That uh, so that their their well-being is something that we can talk to experts about, um, that we can examine the evidence for, and and then we bring it. We 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 learn what those interests are, and then we bring them into a political process via human trustees. Um, so this is. This to me is a very sort of, in a way, strangely unpolitical idea of, of doing politics together. I think of politics as a process where we learn together how to live together and make decisions together. Um, and so, so I've uh, already mentioned some of the problems with the idea that others can simply speak about our interests. So uh, obviously that long and troubled history of, of people speaking for the other, um, we have, and, and continuing to, we have overwhelming um, evidence still, I think, in the case of children and persons with cognitive disabilities, for example, that their interests are not adequately represented by others who claim even to have their best interests at heart. Um, and that uh, that's because children understand their interests quite differently um, and their needs and wants quite differently than adults. So, uh, so somehow we need to find a way to uh, bring them in to the circle of, of deciders um, and those with power uh, to actually shape the world rather than just inheriting the decisions that others make on their behalf. Uh, and I, I think that is a pretty fundamental difference. Yeah, good. I, I understand exactly what you're saying. So it seems to me that you, you offer two separate proposals of how this could be done in practice. Um, and I wonder, well, so one of them is democratising the existing landscape of citizenship, and the other is the, the titular animal agora. So I wondered if you could introduce the kind of differences between these two approaches. Yes, uh, good. So they're, they're both approaches to democratizing our relationships um, with domesticated animals. Uh, but in the first case, uh, I think it's akin to thinking about if we think about processes for, say, democracy, democratizing human workplaces or democratizing relations in the family. Um, what we're, we're, we're still a sort of assuming a background where we, we have workplaces, we have families, uh, and, and the move to democratize relations you know, more broadly in society is, is to, um, to reshape the relationships within those institutions uh, so that you know, patriarchs aren't wielding power uh, um, uh, in the family and uh, business owners aren't wielding power uh, over workers. Uh, that is uh, illegitimate. So I think we can think of a, a parallel process happening in the case of domesticated animals. So even once we remove all of the, you know, violent institutions, the factory farms and uh, everything, uh, we're still going to have domesticated animals living with us in our families, living with us uh, on farms and other places, uh, doing work with us, non-coerced um, work. Uh, possibly. Um, so one way of thinking about the democratization process is to look at those places and spaces where we live uh, with animals and think about how we, um, how we share power in those contexts. Uh, and so what mechanisms could we use to make sure that animals, say, within a family setting uh, are treated as equals and have a say in, in family decisions? Um, rather than simply being subject to the decisions uh, of other family members. So that's one way of thinking about democratization is that we, we go out into the places and spaces where animals are and, uh, and democratize them. But I think this is too limited because those spaces and places have been utterly created and determined by human 
uh, or not utterly, but overwhelmingly created by humans for human purposes. We, so we have certain ideas about where animals belong and where they don't belong. That you know, cows belong not wandering down the city street, but uh, but on a farm in the countryside, uh, dogs belong in the house and the dog park, but they don't uh, belong in the legislature. So we have all these uh, ideas about where animals belong and don't belong. And those uh, places that we've restricted them to have greatly uh, limited their opportunities for uh, just developing in the various ways that they might uh, want to develop, but also for them to shape the world uh, that we share together. So the whole idea of being co-citizens is that we both get to shape, or we all get to shape this world that we share together, or the society or political community that we share. But if we bring them in at this late stage when so many things are fixed and determined, um, then we're, we're from the, uh, the starting gate te terribly limiting their opportunities to, to shape that. So, so the second um, idea about democratizing these relationships is that we somehow have to kind of explode to some extent those traditional ways and places, um, the ways of thinking about what animals' lives are and can be. Uh, and, and the way I uh, envision this is uh, primarily through ideas of free mobility, free association, but also developing a, a, um, a whole new kind of way of thinking about public spaces. So these public spaces need to be much larger. So I'm talking about, you know, all the public spaces that we share. This isn't just inside buildings. This is our streetscapes and our parks and all of these these places, we need to uh, expand them and make them accessible so that animals can freely move around and interact with us uh, in various ways. So it's by creating this sort of new canvas, basically, in which we can interact uh, and uh, imagine and um, explore different ways of living together. This, this is required to genuinely open up the question of what a, a shared society would look like. And so, so one of the obvious things here you could think of right away is that, well, what about cars on the streets and so on? I mean, cars are not designed for the political participation of, of animals or children and many others. And so we can immediately see that to create the kind of space where we could interact in these creative uh, ways of shaping society together would have uh, quite a transformational effect in how we think about public space uh, and who it was designed for. If we think back to, you know, Catherine McKinnon has this famous uh, uh, line about the American society basically being an affirmative action program for men. You know, everything is health studies to uh, physical fitness requirements for the military, whatever. Everything was shaped with a human male in mind. Um, and we can think that that's that's how our that's how our cities, that's how our communities are designed with with human and, and typically adult human um, needs and interests in mind. And so, yeah, so that's the second idea part of that democratizing process explores how we can completely open that up to reimagination by this new idea of an animal agora where they are free to do that with us. Yeah, good. I mean, I hope you can appreciate how radical a lot of this sounds. Or in, in perhaps the language of the political philosopher, this sounds like a kind of ideal theory. It sounds like a vision for, you know, once we've granted animals rights, then we can do it a different way. We should be doing this a different way. So I wonder, do you think that these arguments can have a bearing or should have a bearing on how we interact with animals here and now? Or do you think of this as kind of philosophizing for the future? Uh, yeah, so I, I fully appreciate it. It's a very radical uh, vision. But I think it's actually, we see many instances of this already happening. I mean, every day I'm reading about, say, somebody who's designing um, designing new kinds of architecture, for example, that uh, welcome animals into a space rather than excluding them. Um, so there's, uh, and many people have spoken to me and to Will about how uh, reading zoopolis, for example, changed the way that they interact with their uh, dog and cat companions at home. Um, so there's, I think, 
there's a lot of ways that this kind of um, change towards thinking about the world as one that we share with other beings, uh, not one that we just impose on them, um, is happening from, from the ground up. Um, so that's one thing I, I guess I would say. I would also say, so I, I think it's really important when we, um, when we think about completely changing our relationship with animals, which of course is what we have to do for um, uh, many reasons, and I think there's growing recognition of that. I think it's really important that we see, have goals in mind that recognize the joy and creative potential of this kind of change. So many people worry that, you know, we move to a plant-based economy, that they're just, that, you know, jobs are going to be lost, uh, their access to their favorite foods and items is going to be lost. Uh, people, people see it as a, uh, you know, uh, or some people see it as as deprivation and and as the change as fearful. Um, so I think it's really important to give people narratives, I guess, of what uh, what this different relationship might look like and and uh, the just the, the creative energy, I guess, the liberatory potential of thinking about our relationship with animals in this way and it's something for people to latch on to and get excited about. It sounds like there could be a lot of work for animal studies scholars from a lot of different disciplinary backgrounds here. Um, you're talking about architecture, for example, but we could also think about visual arts. We could also think about, of course, philosophy. We could think about sociology and social sciences. We could think about all kinds of different disciplinary ways to provide this alternative future, this alternative vision. Yes, that's absolutely right. I mean, personally, I've been, um, you know, really inspired by a lot of what's going on in design, um, urban design, uh, geographers um, th thinking about just completely changing these spaces. Um, but you're right. I, th I think it's transforming in, in a really exciting way, potentially, for um for the way many of us work and uh, think about our work or our daily activity. Now, Sue, we ask everybody who's a guest on Knowing Animals to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? I am. I'll try to be quick. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Uh, yes, this is the 1980s we're talking, and it was um, Singer's Animal Liberation. And can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? Uh, I had to think about this one for a while. But, so this would be, I think, the mid-1990s, maybe. Um, and it was an essay that was published in a small literary magazine. And it was called, But Wasn't Hitler a Vegetarian? So I think I, it was, you know, responding to those ad Hitlerian arguments against vegan and vegetarianism and animal rights. Good. Yeah, well, we need to respond to that because they keep coming up, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> If you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Oh boy, it's really hard. Uh, I could name I could name so many, but um, I am going to cheat and and mention two people who really had a big influence on me early on. Um, so one is Barbara Smuts. And it, her descriptions of her interactions with the Boone communities and with her dog Safi um, really uh, had a an impact on me. So they, they helped me to really see what it means to look for and expect others to be subjects or agents and, and in so doing to enable them to be subjects and agents. So that basic idea has had informed my work ever since. And uh, that, that, that idea that agency isn't so much a, a capacity located within individuals um, as a phenomenon created uh, in intersubjective relationship. So that was hugely influential. I was also hugely influenced by Paola Cavalieri's work on the animal question and on, on getting the human out of human rights. Uh, and, and really also on the remarkable example that she and her husband Franco provide of, of committed scholarship and advocacy for animals. Yes, two very worthy names there. So what do you think is the most important thing that academics can do for animals? Well, I think it's crucial that our work be grounded in 
firsthand knowledge of and experience with animals. Um, so I, I don't think we need any more so-called animals are good to think with uh, from the ivory tower. I, I think we need to find ethical ways to learn with and from uh, and about animals uh, directly um, and with the aim of making things better for them. Yes, good. So I'm reminded of the work you've done um, on animals in farmed animal sanctuaries as a kind of example of that sort of uh, thinking with and learning from. Well, thinking with very practically, learning from practically. Exactly. So if you had the power to change one thing about the human non-human animal relationship, what would it be? Uh, well, I guess I I would just wish we could hit the refresh refresh button um, and recover some sense of awe or enchantment or curiosity um, about these other beings who, who share the earth with us and, and how they want to live. So what is it that you're working on next? Uh, well, I'm, I'm working on two follow-up papers to the Animal Agora that we've been talking about today. Uh, so one is focused on the nature of public space and public things. So how our political relationships with animals are navigated through physical environments and objects and institutional structures. So that's one paper. Um, another is focused uh, specifically on the question of political agency. Um, and this, this goes back to actually what I was just saying about Barbara Smut's work uh, affecting my my views of agency, uh, and specifically how we should understand uh, the ontology of political agency as as a relational and a distributed phenomenon, uh, and not as a capacity of agents uh, who exercise sovereign intention or control. Um, so I'm continuing basically to mine a quite specific theme uh, within the broader topic of political theory and animals. Yes, good. So how can people find out more about your work? Uh, right, yeah, I have a, a Google Scholar page and an Academia page uh, where most of my work is posted. Uh, and the activities of our, our Apple Research Group at Queen's, um, they can be found at our website, which is animalpolitics.queensu.ca. Great. Well, thanks so much for joining us for this episode of Knowing Animals, Sue. Thanks, Josh. It's been a real pleasure. And thank you, listeners, for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal studies scholars about their work. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or on Facebook at knowing animals. You can also follow me on Twitter at Josh L. Milburn or on Instagram at a vegan philosopher. Also, don't forget to tell others about knowing animals and to review the podcast on iTunes. Reviews make it easier for others to find us. My name's Josh Milburn and I do like knowing animals. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Oh.